Amen. So keep your place there in John chapter 20. We're going to look at the events of John chapter 20 and also some events um, elsewhere in the Gospels. So we're talking about um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, maybe the most important event in the entire Bible we're going to talk about um, this morning. The Bible um, talks about in all four Gospels to a degree um, the resurrection story or um, pieces of it. Look down at verse number 30 of John chapter 20. The Bible says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So one thing that we need to understand about, especially the Gospels, is the Gospels, many of the Gospels will give details that other Gospels won't. So, I mean, that to me is a great proof of the Bible, but you have to also understand that um, when you read um, the Gospels, because many Gospels will say things that the other Gospel doesn't. And what it's doing is it's giving us a different perspective of the same event. So I want to kind of piece t together for you the events of the resurrection this morning. Of course, the resurrection um, necessary for our salvation. I'll talk to you about that um, in a few minutes as well. But we're going to look at, you know, piecing together the chronology of the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. And let's see if we can put this together and see what this um, has to do with us Today, Look at Matthew chapter 28, and let's get a different perspective. The thing about the Gospels that's, that's funny to me is many people will say, oh, you know, they'll, they'll point out differences in, in each Gospel from the, the perspective of, you know, the writer of the Gospel. And they'll say, see, that's not the same as this over here. But the thing is, if it would be exactly the same, then all they would do is say, see, they just copied each other, <laughs> which is funny. But... You know, I'm going to show you this morning that as we read the Bible, we have to understand that what the Gospels are doing is they're just filling in gaps and filling in details um, that other Gospel writers um, didn't focus on. Look at Matthew chapter 28 and look at verse number 1. So the Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, the first day of the week, of course, being Sunday, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So here we see that there was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, coming to see um, um, Jesus at the, at the tomb. But in other Gospels, by the way, this proves that the cru crucifixion, again, was on Wednesday, as this couldn't have been, the, the Sabbath that they're talking about was Saturday. It was the Saturday Sabbath, not the Thursday Sabbath of the first day of unleavened bread. But we talked about that on Wednesday. But there was actually at least three women um, that went to see Jesus here because other Gospels talk about Mary and Mary and Salome going to the tomb. But just because Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the sepulcher, that doesn't mean that that was the only um, one. This Gospel doesn't say only Mary Magdalene and only Mary, um, the mother of James, came to see the sepulcher. It's just giving us more detail um, and less detail than the other Gospels that talk about the third woman there as well. Look at verse number two. And behold... There was a great earthquake. Notice how God, he makes these events known. You know, he makes these events known. When there's a resurrection, when Jesus died on the cross, these are great events and they are, they are very visible to the world. You know, showing us that when Jesus comes back, you know, everyone's going to know about that. That's not going to be something that God hides. That's not how God operates, especially when it comes to Jesus Christ. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning. So here we're getting more detail than in John chapter 20. And his raiment white as snow, giving us detail about the angel. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Notice how it says there that Jesus told people. I'm going to show you that. Um, Jesus told people he was going to rise from the dead. It's just no one heard him. No one understood what he was talking about, including the disciples, by the way. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There he shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus 
met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Now, in John chapter 20, in verse number 17, I don't really want to delve into too much detail about this, but Mary goes to, you know, hold Jesus or embrace Jesus or touch Jesus, and he says, Don't touch me. I have not ascended to my, my father. You know, I don't personally, have, you know, I know people, um, friends of mine, and maybe you, um, you know, read into that. I don't read too much into that other than he just didn't want to be embraced at that time because they did grab him by the feet here. Um, they did touch his feet here. So um, he just, you know, didn't want to be embraced um, by them at this time. But they did, you know, hold him by the feet and worship him. Look down at Matthew 28 in verse number 10. And other people, you know, that's not a big deal if you have a, a different opinion about that. It's maybe one of those things we have to learn about when we get to heaven and ask Jesus. Look at verse number 10. Then Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city. Now this is interesting. These are the, the Roman soldiers that were, that were given um, as the, the Pharisees demanded that the, the tomb be guarded so they wouldn't steal the body. They actually saw the angel, and they were, in, they were the watch. They were so afraid that they froze the Bible says. And look, and when they were assembled with the elders, they had taken counsel, they gave large amount of money, large of money to, unto the soldiers. They showed unto the chief priests, in verse 11, all the things that were done. They went and they told the priests about the angel. They told the priest about the earthquake. They told the priest about exactly what happened. And what did they do? They paid them money. They paid them money saying, Say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So look, first of all, there was a huge commotion that was caused here. There was a huge earthquake. An angel in shining um, bright white um, raiment you know, was seen by these soldiers. And look, the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. And we say, why is that important? Because this was a bodily resurrection. I mean, Jesus' body rose from the dead. I mean, this was not a, a spirit, you know, the walking around. This was Jesus' body, which is proven many other places. They held him by the feet. We'll see that Thomas actually touches him. Jesus eats with the disciples several times. Look, this was a bodily resurrection. The tomb was empty. It's important to know. So what is the chronology of events that we've seen so far? Let me put it together for you real quick. We see at least three women first go to the tomb. We see Mary, Mary, and Salome go to the tomb. Maybe there was more women. The way the Gospels are written, it's possible that there could have been more because none of the Gospels say only these women. So it could have been more than that, but we know at least those three went. Then they go and they tell Peter and John first. And then Peter and John have a race, you know, which John outruns Peter to the tomb. And then Mary Magdalene and the women return to the tomb as well. Mary Magdalene returns to the tomb, and then she sees the angels, and then she sees Jesus, which is when she, you know, holds him, you know, holds him by the feet or worships him at his feet. Now, it's interesting here, and it's interesting to point out, and I, you know, I have no opinion why this is, but the women saw him first. Mary saw him first. But it's also interesting to note that it was the women that never left Jesus. It was the women that were at the cross with Jesus. It was the women who were attending to the tomb. Look, the women never left Jesus. I think that's why, you know, he showed himself to them first. That's just my opinion. But um, they never left him, and, and Mary saw him first. Look at verse number 9 of Matthew 28. Then they go back, and they tell all the disciples. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So later that same day, Turn to Luke chapter 24. So we see that the women went to the tomb. The women went to the tomb. They saw the tomb was empty. They went back. They told Peter and John. Then they came back with Peter and John. That's when Mary and maybe other women saw Jesus at that point. That was the first sighting of Jesus. But now look at verse number 34 of Luke chapter 24. So who's the second person to see Jesus? Saying, um, the women say, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. So at some point, Jesus also appeared to Peter. And they told what things that were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking bread. This is um, the, the disciples telling the two um, men on the road. But I'll get to that in just a minute. So here we have, we have the women see Jesus. 
Then Peter, at some point, sees Jesus. And then on that same day is when Jesus appears to Cleopas and another disciple on the road to Emmaus. I'm not going to get into that story. But then that evening, Jesus appears to the eleven in Jerusalem. Look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 32. Luke chapter 24 and verse 32. And this is the two disciples that have already seen Jesus. They're talking to the, the main group of disciples. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with him saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. So here, he's already appeared to the women, he's already appeared to Simon, he already appeared to the two men on the road, and now um, they're telling him what happened, and then Jesus now appears to the main group of disciples. And Thomas is not there. Go back to John chapter 20. So we see that Thomas is not there the first time Jesus appears to the main group of disciples. Look at verse number 19 of John chapter 20. Verse number 19 of John chapter 20. Then the same day at evening, this is all the same day, by the way. This is all the Sunday that Jesus has risen um, from the dead. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So here they were, they were, um, they were hidden away. They were hidden away so the Jews wouldn't find them. Came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. But look down at verse number 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. They've told Thomas. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands in the print, in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Then, eight days later, look at John chapter 20 and verse number 26. Eight days later, now we're out of Sunday, eight days later, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Now Thomas is there. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold, my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. He's like, hey, whatever you need to do, <laughs> whatever you need to do to believe it's me, let, let's just do it. Let's just get it done. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. And then he says, blessed are they that have not seen, and yet believed. So here we see Jesus appears to the main group of disciples twice. Once the first day, and once, eight days later, with Thomas present, Thomas gets the proof that he needs. And Jesus says, look, it would have been better if you would have not needed to do, see this, but, you know, at least you believed. Look at verse, um, go to John chapter 21 and verse 14. Then Jesus even appears to the seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee. So there's Peter and six other disciples, and Jesus appears to them. After this happens, look at verse 14. And it's interesting to note here that when Jesus appears to Peter and the six other disciples as they're out fishing, this was the third time that he had appeared to the large group of disciples. The third time. So obviously, he appeared to the women right away. He appeared to Peter. And then he appeared to the large group of disciples twice. And then he appears again to Peter when he's out fishing. And it says in verse number 14, now this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So look, I want you to get this picture here. Okay, This is what, all that to say this. I want you to get this picture. Jesus is just showing up in the first week, the first week and a half, the first couple of weeks. Jesus is showing up several different times to show the disciples that he has risen from the dead, that he has bodily risen from the dead. The three women go to see Jesus, at Mary, Mary, and Salome. Then they actually, they go get Peter and John. They come back. Then Mary Magdalene and the women return to the tomb, and they see Jesus the first time. Then Jesus, at some point, appears to Peter. 
Then Jesus appears to the men on the road, the two disciples on the road. Then he appears to the group of disciples without Thomas. Then eight days later, he appears to the group of disciples with Thomas and proves to Thomas that it's him by showing him, you know, touching the hands and touching the, the side. Um, and then Jesus appears. Then, you know, after he appears to the 11 disciples and he shows Thomas this great, you know, this great event, then... Peter goes fishing with six disciples. Peter just, you know, I mean, look, they've seen Jesus several times at this point. And then Jesus again comes and shows himself to Peter and the six disciples that are out fishing. So the point I want to look at this morning is now that we know that this is what's happened, that Jesus showed himself several times, you, you kind of look at this and you read it and you say, why, what, why aren't they doing it? What are they doing? You know, they're seeing Jesus, and they're just kind of like, yeah, okay, he's risen from the dead. And they're, first of all, they're surprised by it, which is also interesting, because if you've read the Gospels up to this point, you know that, you know, Jesus not only mentioned it, but it's, it's predicted in the Old Testament, it's prophesied in the Old te Testament. But let's just look at the reactions to the resurrection this morning. Look at the women. What were the women doing? You know, it's a, good, good, it's a good story for the women. The women were still serving. The women just never stopped serving. The women were at the cross, and I get it. They weren't as much of a threat, and they probably weren't under pressure um, of arrest like the men were. But needless to say, they were still serving. They were still going and visiting the tomb. They were attending to his body. They were at the cross. Maybe they were not in front. Maybe they were not the leaders. Maybe they were not the most important. Maybe they weren't the ones being threatened. But they were still present. They were still present. Turn to John chapter 21. The disciples, the disciples were confused. It's clear that they were confused. They were confused. The Bible says that they were in hiding. Even during this time that Jesus was showing himself to them, they were hiding. They were fearing the Jews. They were hiding. They were staying away from them. Look at John 21 and verse number 1. After these things... Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise he showed himself. This was the third time, and they were out fishing. Look at verse number two. They were together, they were together, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus. Thomas had already touched the man. He'd already touched Jesus Christ after he had risen. And Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into the ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. So they just, they just didn't understand. They just didn't understand what was going on, and instead of asking, they just quit. Peter just went and went about his own business. He went fishing, and look, he brought others with him. He brought six other people with him. He caused others to quit. But not only did Jesus tell them directly that he would rise again, which is why this might be confusing when you read this, but I want to explain it to you this morning. Not only did Jesus tell them directly he would rise again, but the Old Testament predicted that Jesus was right again, would rise again. Turn to Psalm 16. Let me just give you a couple examples. Look at Psalm chapter 16 and look at verse number 10. Look at Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 10. The fact that Jesus would die was predicted in the Old Testament. It was prophesied about the Messiah, but it was also prophesied that the Messiah would rise again from the dead. Look at Psalm 16 and verse number 10. Psalm 16 and verse number 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. So we talked about how Jesus' soul, after he was crucified on the cross, after he died, his soul went to hell in the Bible. I mean playing out, completing that perfect picture of Leviticus chapter 16, as there is a burnt sacrifice at the end of the Day of Atonement. Jesus is that full picture. That's why, you know, people also argue that, that um, when Jesus said, it is finished, you know, that's an argument against Jesus' soul going to hell. Well, Jesus obviously didn't mean that everything was finished. I mean, Jesus hadn't risen from the dead at that point when he said, it is finished. So that's kind of a silly um, argument, that aside. But look, three days, three days is interesting because look at what it says at the end of Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 10. It says, not only will thou not leave my soul in hell, it says, neither will thou, 
will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That means his body would not decompose in the grave. And anybody who's ever had animals or had anything die or everything knows that it's about three days when that body is, you, you must get rid of it within three days. Trust me. Because after that point, you know, it just it immediately starts, you know, seeing corruption, to put it nicely. Okay, turn to Isaiah chapter 53. So the Bible here is saying that, you know, not only will his soul not stay in hell, but his body would not stay in the grave either. His body would rise again. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. This is in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall prolong his days, showing that he would be risen from the dead. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So, the Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would rise from the dead. So why was it such a surprise to the disciples. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at why, you know, let's look at how important the resurrection is before we get into why um, and what the disciples needed to know from Jesus. Let's look at how important the resurrection is. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse number 1. Paul says this. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So Paul here is saying, he says, I declare unto you the gospel. He says, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which ye are saved. How are ye saved? Through the gospel. It's like, by which ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So where did Paul receive the gospel? Paul received the gospel from Jesus Christ. Paul received the gospel directly from Jesus himself. So he's saying, he's talking about the gospel in the context of what he's saying here, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. So is that the gospel right there in verse number three? Is that the whole gospel in verse number three? No, he says, look, he says, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And verse number four, he says, and, and, he's saying, this is the gospel. And means it's, a, it's part of it. It's part of the gospel. He says, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day, what? According to the scriptures. Just what I read you. Just what I read you in Psalm 16. Just what I read you in Isaiah 53. The scriptures predicted this. The scriptures said that this would happen. But the point is, is that the resurrection is part of the gospel. The resurrection completes the gospel. He says, you know, Christ died for your sins, you know, he, he was buried, and he rose again. That is all the gospel. You know, I mean, that's not the details of it. I mean, the details is this. The de I mean, why did Christ have to die for our sins? It's because we have a sin problem. You know, you have a sin problem. The Bible says, as it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. You say, who has a sin problem? Everybody. Everybody has a sin problem. Well, who sinned? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says that because of that sin, what you deserve for that sin, the wages of that sin, is death. What you deserve for it is death. The Bible des describes this death as not only a physical death, but a spiritual death, a second death. That the Bible calls in Revelation, it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Being cast into that eternal punishment, that everlasting torment. I mean, the Bible calls this second death, this spiritual death, it calls it everlasting torment. It calls it everlasting chains in the Bible. It's punishment that you deserve because of your sin that lasts for eternity. It's the most horrible thing that you could ever think of in your entire life. But the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. What you deserve for your sin is death. That's why, you know, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. But then in Romans 6.23, the Bible says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first part of the Gospel. He's saying that Christ died for our sins 
according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ came and he, God became a man. He lived a perfect life. Jesus had no sin. He had no sin in his life. He, he was tempted as though you're tempted. He had all the things put in front of him, just like all the things that you put in front, have put in front of you where we fail, and he didn't fail. And instead, he lived this perfect life. He did all sorts of miracles on this earth. And then he died this terrible death that we've been talking about for the last week and a half. He was tortured, he was beaten, and he was put on the cross, and he was killed. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then he was buried, the Bible says. And then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that is, that is what Jesus Christ did. You know, the death, the burial, the resurrection. That's what he did. So how can we benefit from that as people? In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved. That means you're saved from that second death. Saved from that spiritual death. Saved from that eternal, that everlasting torment that you deserve, that we all deserve for our sin. For by grace are ye saved through what? Through faith. Amen. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of of God. And that word gift is super important that you understand that gift. And then the Bible says in verse number 9, it says, not of works. It's a gift. Look, if something is a gift, it's either a gift or it's not. If you have to pay anything for it, it's not a gift. You know, the way, uh, you know, the funny thing with, with churches today and, and the confusion that's just put out there today is that everyone, nobody can just understand that it's just not of works. Everybody has to think like, well, it's got to be a little bit of works. You know, it's got to be a little bit of works. Like, at least, maybe if I believe in Jesus, I'll get the gift, but then I have to work to keep the gift. No, it's not a gift then. If you have to work to keep it, it's the same as having to work to get it. It's the same thing. You know, it's like having somebody, it's like having somebody, you know, build you a house. And it's the most perfect house that you could ever be built. And it's just, there's nothing wrong with this house. It's complete. It's the perfect house. And they say, this is your house. This house is a gift. And you wonder why God is so, you know, hard on people that try to add any works at all to salvation. Just think about this. Think about being given something great like that. And it doesn't even compare. Your eternal salvation doesn't even compare to something like a house. But think about it. It's a perfect house. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the best house that's ever been built. And it's yours. And you come to that house and you receive it and you take it and you go and you pound a nail in the wall and say, see, I helped build this too. How mad would that make the builder who went through, you know, and you can't even compare it. This builder sent his only son to die a horrible death, die on the cross, be tortured, killed, go to hell, come back, and all you have to do is believe on that to receive that gift. Don't try to pound another nail in that house. Or the Bible says there's no grace for you if you do that. You know, I mean, it's, it's not of works. It's not a little bit of works. I mean, the wall, you say, this wall right here, that wall is white. Well, you can't come up and say, well, the wall's red. And I say, no, it's white. You say, well, it's a little bit red. No, it's not a little red. It's white. It's not a little bit red. It's not any red at all. It's not of works. It's not a little bit of works. It's not of works. Jesus Christ and believing on that, on what he did, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Amen. When you believe on Jesus, when you, when you accept that it's all or nothing, and you say, you know what, I completely trust in that, you have everlasting life. And it's everlasting. You can never lose it. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It's, it's the best verse ever. It's so simple. It's not even a little bit of your works. If you think it's a little bit of your works, you've not believed on. You've not believed on. You've, you've, believed, you've believed that Jesus was there and that you also had to do good works. That's not believing on. That's not, as Ephesians 1 calls, believing on, trusting. To trust is to completely let go of anything of yourself. But look at Romans 10, chapter 9. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
So the Bible says that, you know, Jesus, God just wants you to ask for it. You know, God just wants you to ask for it. Believe that God hath done what, though? Isn't that interesting? Believe that God hath raised him from the dead. So really, as we're talking about Easter, we're talking about the resurrection this morning. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about the completion of the gospel. We're talking about the completion. It's, it's clearly not what it is finished meant on the cross because the gospel is you must believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You can't believe, oh, Jesus died for my sins, but yeah, he didn't really rise from the dead or he rose spiritually like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe or whatever. It's like, no, you must believe in the resurrection because look, that's what defeats death that you deserved. That's the picture. That is, the resurrection is the completion of the gospel. So Jesus' message after the resurrection, and you're confused. You know, he's like, he's, he's going out there. He's like, hey, I told you this was going to happen. This is what he's talking to the disciples about. He's like, I told you this was going to happen. So did the Old Testament. Go to Mark chapter 9. Go to Mark chapter 9. Go to Mark chapter 9. He says, you know, the Old Testament talked about how the Messiah would rise again. The Messiah would bodily, would have a bodily resurrection. But Jesus told them directly too. Look at Mark 9, verse 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, this is before, this is before Jesus even went to the cross. He taught his disciples and said unto them, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. I mean, that's pretty direct. But look at the next verse. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. So it's clear by the way the disciples were acting after the resurrection that they did not understand this saying. They did not understand at all. Turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Jesus finally opens their eyes to this. Look at Luke chapter 24. And look at verse number 45. Luke chapter 24, and look at verse number 45. Then after the resurrection, Jesus says, he says, Then he opened he their understanding. So Jesus knew that they didn't understand this. This is why you see Peter acting the way he's acting. The other six disciples acting the way that they're acting. Maybe we're beating up a little too much on Peter. But look, the point is, they just didn't get it. They didn't understand. You're like, how could they, get, how could they not get it? Well, well, most Christians today don't get it either. Look at Luke 24, verse 45. Then he opened their understanding that they may understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it is behooved. Behooved means it's his duty. It's what he's supposed to do. It's his purpose. And thus it is his purpose. He has behooved Christ to suffer, not only to suffer, but what? But to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance or remission of sins should be preached. What? It, does everyone just get remission of sins? And, you know, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. And ye are witnesses of these things. That's why he came back and appeared to the disciples. Right there. To tell them, look, he's like, now people need to repent. What do they need to do? They need to change their mind. They need to believe on this. This gospel's done now. This gospel's finished now. People need to turn from whatever they're at right now. Turn from, you know, unbelief to belief in this finished work right here is what people need to do. He's like, and then they'll have remission of sins. And this needs to be what? What, is it, what needs to happen? It needs to be preached. Amen. It needs to be preached among who? All nations starting here, he says. Well, who's going to do it? You! That's what he says in verse, verse 48. He says, and ye are witnesses of these things. This is the whole point of the Great Commission. This is why Jesus gave the Great Commission. Look at Matthew 28. Verse 19. Look at Matthew 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, look, go out there teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always until the end of the world. Amen. He's saying this is what he's doing. He came back and he appeared again and again and again. He opened their understanding. He says, hey, it's time to get to work. Who? It's you. It's who he's saying. It's you that have to go out and preach this to people. So what's the application? What's the application for us? So the point is, don't read the Bible. Don't read the Old Testament and sit there and look at you know, Israel and say, idiots. Because we're just as big of idiots, maybe more than they are in the Bible. 
Open our own eyes and look at where we're at. And then look at, you know, same thing with the disciples. You know, if Jesus came back tomorrow, what would he see Christians doing? A whole lot of nothing is what I'm telling you. He would, you, know, you know what he'd find them doing? You know, today, in America, you know what he'd find them doing? He'd find them hiding. You know, maybe they're out there doing some fishing. Not that I'm beating up on fishing here. But the point is, you know, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is Christians everywhere. I mean, so don't read the Gospels and just be like, what in the world? And beat up on these guys because, you know what? The vast majority of Christians are doing the exact same thing. A whole lot of nothing. A whole lot of cowering. A whole lot of not telling the truth. A whole lot of just, they're just living in that house. That's what they're doing. They got the free house, and they're just living there. They're saved. Look, if, if they can be saved. They believe that Jesus died for them. They believe that Jesus rose again. And they're just, they're trusting in that, not themselves. They're just not doing anything about it. That's the problem. I mean, they got theirs, right? This is the Christian today. And you know what? The Christian today is probably a lot like the disciples there. Like many Christians today, they just don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. I mean, how many times are you talking to these, how many times do you meet saved people out there and they're not going to church, they're not, if they're going to church, they're going to some church that doesn't teach anything. They don't even know that they're supposed to be doing this. They have no idea. They're just living lives for themselves, living in that, living in that perfect house. You know, that they were given for free. We're, you know, Christians today are no different than this. And, and you read these stories and, you know, you're just like, wow, but we need to open our eyes. Turn to Romans 10. We need to open our eyes and understand that the more things change, the more things stay the same. Things are no different today. You see, because here's the thing. Why did, why did Jesus commission them? Why did Jesus commission them? Why couldn't Jesus have, you know, just had a bunch of scribes just like making copies of the Gospels and just throwing them out the windows and just everything? Why not do that? Why not just have the Bible out there? But look at, you know, God can preserve his word. He did. But look what he says in Romans 10, 14. Romans 10, 14. This is why Jesus came back and commissioned these men. He came back and he commissioned the disciples because in Romans 14, 10, 14, it says, how then they, shall they call on him who they have not believed? So look, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that in Romans 10, 9, it is saying, you will call for him. You will ask to be saved. It's just something that's going to happen. Nobody's going to like, you know, get saved and believe that and not like call out to the Lord that saved them. It's saying, look, how shall they call on him and who they have not believed? So if you don't believe, you're not going to call out for the Lord. That's pretty obvious, right? But guess what? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? So that's, that's saying right there that people aren't going to believe the gospel unless they what? I mean, this isn't rocket science here, but it says unless they hear it. They're not going to believe the gospel unless they hear it. Well, how are they going to, how are they going to hear it? How are they going to hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to be preaching it. Somebody's got to like, look, people aren't going to just go out and read it themselves. There needs to be a preacher. There needs to be a soul winner who's bringing it to them. That is the design. That is, that is why God commissioned the disciples. Because somebody needs to go out and tell these people in all these nations. And he's like, guess what? It's you. Someone has to tell them, look, here's the thing, folks. The nicest guy, the nicest guy that you've ever known. Think about a nice guy in your life, somebody that's just really nice, would just do anything to help you, all this. The nicest guy in this world, if he dies without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to spend an eternity in hell. Right. The nicest guy. You're like, well, but what? Because guess what? Being a bad person is not what sends a man to hell. That's why that is. Being a bad person, it's not believing the gospel is what sends somebody to hell. And how shall they hear if somebody doesn't go tell them? Turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Look, folks, 
Plenty of disinformation is working from the other side. You know, Satan works the same way. Satan works the same way. Satan has the majority of churches in this world that's going out there and preaching. You've got to pound nails into this house. You've got to build this house yourself. Oh, yeah, there's this Jesus guy, but you better start building that house. Look, that's, that's the preaching that people are hearing. That's the preaching that people are hearing. So look, the other side, the wicked side, is using this same method. They're out there, they're preaching false gospels, works-based salvation, and it's going to send people straight to hell. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33. Somebody that, somebody that dies a nice guy and doesn't believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, and guess what? Rose again from the dead is going to spend an eternity in hell. And Jesus is commissioning the disciples to go out and tell them it's their responsibility. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33. Look at verse number 6. It gets even, it gets even more, than, more serious than this. Though. Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 6 says, But if the watchman, that's you, by the way, but if the watchman see the sword come, look, we know. We know what's going to happen to that nice guy. We know what's going to happen to somebody that doesn't believe on Jesus, including the resurrection. It says, but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet. This is the guy that's living in the house saying nothing. And does not blow the trumpet and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. You know what he's saying? God here is not only saying that it's your job, he's saying that if that nice guy... If somebody goes to hell, it, look, because there's a lot of people out there that, and you know, if you're a soul winner, you know this. We went out and we knocked, we knocked 200 doors yesterday, and we got four people saved. Think about that, though. That's 196 doors of people that were not interested. But this is someone, look, they were warned, though, were they not? Were they not warned? The Bible here is saying is if you don't warn them, it's your fault. That's what Ezekiel 33, 6 is saying. God is saying that, yes, it's your job, but if that nice guy goes to hell, or that's somebody, you know, if one of those four people, and imagine, look, imagine this, the 196 people that are going to go to hell because they don't want to hear the gospel, look, that's not on us because we warn them. But here's what's even worse. Here's what's even worse. Imagine one of those four people that would go to hell, that would have believed if somebody just would have preached to them. How many people like that are there going to be? I'm thinking a lot. Because there's a lot of people living in that house that won't come out of that house to preach and to warn people. But you know what? It's tough knocking 196 doors of people that are not interested. But you know what? I always think that. You go out and you have those tough days out soul winning, and you knock 100 doors or you knock 150 doors, and nobody wants to hear. I'm just like, hey, that's one, that's one door closer to the guy that wants to hear. Amen. And look, Warning is part of it. Warning is part of Ezekiel 33. It's, we're warning, but look, then we get a chance to preach to people. So look, there's plenty of disinformation working on the other side. We need to be out there preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the completion of the Gospels. So don't beat up on these guys and say, you know what, how, how, are, they, how are they not understanding this? Because... They were commissioned by Jesus Christ. And you know what? Most Christians today, they don't understand either. They don't understand either. We're commissioned as well. We're commissioned as well. We're commissioned to go out and tell others. And you know what? It's not something. It's not something. As a matter of fact, I think every single day, it's something that people want to hear less and less. But we're still supposed to tell them. You know what? That takes courage. That takes coming out of hiding. That takes coming out and just saying, you know what, I don't care. That, look, that's why, that's why at this church we will preach the whole Bible. We'll preach the whole thing. You'll come here and you'll hear, and visitors may come here, and they will hear things and they're like, ah, what in the world? I've never heard anything like that before. That's because that nobody is preaching like they're supposed to. We're going to preach the whole thing. Because I tell you what, I'm going to at least warn people. I'm going to at least warn people. And as far as everything in the Bible, I'm going to warn you as well. So when you sit in the pews, even as a saved person, you hear something from the Bible you don't like to hear, look, I'm just, I'm just warning you. Right. Not just about the gospel, but about the whole counsel of God. So Jesus was coming back, 
And he came back and he appeared so many times. And the reason that there was so much confusion is because they didn't know what they were supposed to do. Now we know. Because of the resurrection, because of Jesus' commissioning of the disciples, not only did they figure it out, did their understanding awaken, but we know too. So this Easter, just keep that in mind, that you're commissioned just like the disciples. And thank God for the resurrection. Thank God for Easter because it's, it's the seal of the gospel. It's the completion of the gospel. What a, what a great day and event this is to celebrate is basically the gospel being complete for us to preach to everyone else. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.